The 09 periods are an exciting new program where CMSD students can enjoy additional learning time when it comes to art, music, physical education, and more. Joining me now to talk about this program is Jeffrey Allen, the Director of Arts Education. Well, welcome, Jeffrey. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks for being here. So the the periods zero and nine mm -hmm. obviously indicate that this is like before and after program. Mm -hmm. Well, just talk about what kids and families can expect with the zero and nine period. Sure. One of the most exciting things about the zero and nine period is the opportunity for scholars to go deep in either art, music, or physical education, uh, up to five days a week at any given school. Uh, that's happening across 60 of our K-8 buildings right now, which is super exciting. So they might have the opportunity to have their middle school band program or a choir or a show choir or um, a theatrical production or um, a running club or a lifting club, a yoga class, um, an animation club, a comic book club, a ceramics course. If you can dream it, we can make it happen. That is amazing. So do the children really indicate what type of interest they want to happen at the schools or is it, or, or is the school offering it to the students? It's a good marriage of the two. Uh, based on what the skill set of, uh, of the amazing educators in each building, what they can bring to the table, what perhaps a community partner can bring in to supplement and add to, uh, coupled with what the student interests are. Uh, I mean, obviously, if, you know, a, if a group of students wanted to do uh, underwater basket weaving, I'm just making that up for fun, and nobody was qualified to do that, we probably wouldn't offer it right, right. away. Uh, but the idea is like having that nice synergy between the two of what, what we know we can offer and what people are looking to get. Uh, it also gives us some aspirations. If there's something we know that the community really wants, who are the people we need to have at the table to make that happen. Wonderful. And you just mentioned our amazing community partners. Can mm -hmm. you just talk about some of them that are offering their skills and their talents to our students? Sure. Before I do that, though, I have to give an amazing shout out to so many community partners that over a year worked with me on developing this plan that we're now executing and making making reality for our scholars. Uh, they've been with us every step of the way. So, you know, partners like Cleveland Orchestra, Cleveland Museum of Art, Cleveland Public Theater, Playhouse Square, uh, Center for Arts Inspired Learning, Dancing Classrooms. I, the list can go on and on and on, and of course, once you start listing, you know you accidentally left somebody out. So nothing but love for our amazing community that w is working with us in the past, in the present, and in the future to make sure that this plan to make robust arts happen for our, our scholars continues and moves forward. Right, and it really all began, I know you said the planning was a year in, it, in the making, mm -hmm. but it was really implemented during the summer learning experience. Well, let's take a look at some of the programs that the students participated in during the summer learning experience. I mean, what, a, what an amazing springboard to be able to bring our scholars together to do arts, in arts projects and music projects over the course of the summer, both with community partners and with our amazing educators. Uh, some of the highlights, there was a, uh, a group of teachers who worked with their scholars to use art to examine how they can transform the Huff neighborhood. Uh, and the students used painting on top of photographs to imagine the things that they wanted to see in their community and brought that to community leaders to say, this is what we want our world to look like. Uh, and what an amazing opportunity to give voice to students to say, this is what we see and this is how we want to change it and we're going to express ourselves that way. Uh, our music students having the opportunity to pick up an instrument after a year and a half. Uh, you know, because what people may not realize is that typically it's in fourth grade when you first have an opportunity in music class to pick up an instrument. It's developmentally appropriate. Fourth graders who came, to, came of age during the pandemic missed that opportunity. So by having a program that addressed that over the summer, kids were able to pick up an instrument and successfully play over a very compressed period of time with some amazing educators. And uh, truthfully, this, this is really geeky. The thing that excited <laughs> me the most about that program is I was watching the students put their eyes on the conductor. You can teach technique, you can improve technique, but being able to create that communication where they know where to look, how to follow the cues is priceless. Uh, and having that level of excitement, the parents who came out and were saying, we're gonna do this in all of our schools. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we're gonna do this in all of our schools. This is gonna be a reality and we're gonna do it. Uh, it may happen fast in some schools, slower in others, based on how we build community partnerships and the skill sets that are available on day one versus where we are at the end of the year. Uh, I can't help but think about where we're gonna be in three years. Yeah. Today's, today's sixth grader 
when they're taking these programs and they've been doing it for three years and they're in eighth grade. What an amazing thing we're going to see. The leadership we'll see from them in their, in their buildings and then where they're going to go when they choose their high schools and forward and forward. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, there's only one direction and it's forward. Of course. I mean, one of the things that was amazing is the marching band at John Marshall. Yes. I mean, they, a lot of those students had never picked up an instrument and within four to six weeks they were mm -hmm. able to not only play but also march. And you know, we have this, we have this vision that we're going to continue that program every summer uh, and it's my hope and I'm, I'm dreaming here, <laughs> it's my hope that we'll do a unified camp for all schools and then part two of that camp will be your individual school nice. uh, so that, you know, that we'll have our CMSD Marching 100 uh, that works for multiple schools but we also have each school having their own marching bands. Well, so. it is okay to dream, right? <laughs> oh, it, you know, that's the most important thing and I think that's one of the things that the arts in general really fulfill for us in our humanity is it is the place where we dream, it's the place where we imagine, it's the place where we push the boundary and say what if, what if this, what if that. And giving students and schools the flexibility and the opportunity to create dream spaces uh, as part of the curriculum, of course that, that's great for kids, of course that's great for society, of course that's great for humanity. Well, so let's just talk about that. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, obviously school is about teaching the core subjects, but, mm -hmm. you know, art is so important, too, because it's helping to teach the whole child and give them social-emotional learning mm -hmm. as well. Absolutely, and I think that one of the things that we as a nation have done ourselves a disservice is by referring to art and music as not being core. They are essential. Mm -hmm. Anybody who spent time in the pandemic, and we all have, we lived for Netflix. We lived for those podcasts. We lived for music. The creators helped us get through this. Uh, and we all have that innate ability. We are all creators. Whether you curate your life by creating beautiful images around you and great music, or you're the one who's writing the music, uh, having those fundamental skills as part of your core education is essential uh, and lifts up what you're doing. And uh, yeah, it's like when you read a good novel, you're entering into the lives and the minds of another person mm -hmm. in a safe way that lets you have that experience. There's no reason we shouldn't be making this a centerpiece of all of our core. But it's also improving attitudes mm -hmm. and moods, uh, attendance, and grades. I mean, this kids live for this. Some kids live for this. This is some some. This is their whole reason for going to school is to to participate in the arts and then do the rest of the stuff, right? I totally agree. And it's uh, uh, for me, it's the arts. For me, it's the arts, but for me, it's also very important that we have enough programs that kids can find their tribe. Whatever it is that I feel connected to, that opportunity is available to me in school, and that gives me that extra impetus, that extra thing that hooks me in and keeps me going. Whether that's sports, art, music, theater, dance, drama, um, the, the creative writing club, the newspaper club, uh, whatever club it is, whatever program it is, as long as we're hooking you in, we can get you here. I know that you know we talk about the pandemic and we obviously want this to be over, but a part of the pandemic that came out of this was the, the pandemic dollars, the federal dollars mm -hmm. that the federal government is funneling to schools to help with boosting up mm -hmm. the um, education. Can you just talk about how these pandemic dollars are really helping to boost this um, arts education? Absolutely. Uh, the pandemic dollars have really been a game changer and <clears throat> it's part of the CEO's big bet for our district. Uh, uh, a really concrete example, the district has provided well over $12,000 of consumable art supplies to every single art teacher in the district. That is a game changer uh, because it's providing more than adequate tools for every student to be able to use uh, a variety of artistic expression at every single school. Uh, we are putting uh, a basic band kit in every single K-8 building so that from day one, we know that kids will have access to these instruments. Uh, now, of course, you know, we may have to get, you know, school X may need two more trumpets because they have two more trumpet players, but I want that problem. I want to solve that issue instead of we need 12 trumpets. So making sure that everyone has that basic startup kit so everyone can start from the same place, gets right to the core of equity, gets right to the core of doing what we're trying to do as a district, which is to have a, a better, fairer, more just system of education. That's right, and I am excited to see all the artwork and the music uh, that will come from this um, and just see these kids smiling faces as they're doing it. I am with you <laughs> because I think that what we're going to see is going to blow our minds. Wonderful. Well, Jeffrey, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much.
Arielle Snipes with the CMSD News Bureau, and I am here with Executive Chef Tim Wright with the CMSD School Nutrition Department. And today we are talking about breakfast. Yes. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day, right? Without a doubt. It starts you off on the right foot, it gets your mind going and invigorates some learning. So breakfast is really important. And so the great thing is you, we offer breakfast to all our students. So when they come to school, they get a breakfast. So we know that they are well fed right before they start school, right? That's correct. And so we have a new smoothie kit that was provided to CMSD from the American Dairy Association Mid-East Fuel Up to Play 60, correct? So what, yep. is, that, what is that smoothie about? So um, the smoothie uh, kit that we got the grant for, um, we're going to use it to help uh, blenderize some uh, fruits and maybe even vegetables to um, make different kinds of smoothies for the students to enjoy different flavors at mealtime for breakfast. And so the great thing is, is you, so if you don't have a blender at home, some of us don't, I don't have a blender, um, you can just make a smoothie without a blender, which is a great thing, right? Right, so um, I went online and found some blenderless uh, smoothie ideas. And one that we've been trying for the students here is a sunshine smoothie, I call it. Nice. Um, it's got orange juice in it, applesauce, and vanilla yogurt. Well, let's make it. So I'll help you. I'll be your shoe chef today, chef. Sure. So I'll just get some gloves to be safe. There we go. So when it comes to the, the breakfast that CMSD provides for students, I mean, what type of variety do you have? Is it all like cold meals or do you have hot meals as well? Um, both. So we have a grab and go cart that has um, some popular breakfast items that students usually gravitate to, um, but they're healthier than the ones that, that we get from retail. So the, the donuts that we use um, have powdered sugar on them, but they're made with whole grain. So when I compared the packets um, side by side, the one that we serve is uh, lower in fat, calorie, and sugar than the one that you buy off of the street. Nice. So parents and families may think, oh, you're feeding my kid donuts, you know, being too casual about it. but. Um, the ones that we provide are much more healthy than ones that they would get from retail. Perfect. Well, let's make this smoothie. How do you start? What do you need to do first? So for this recipe, I don't know if you can find the, the little okay. the thumb thing to take off the label there. So for this recipe, it was um, 16, 16 ounces of yogurt. Okay. Or, pardon me, 16 ounces of applesauce. Okay. So these little things that you get at the store, they're already in four ounce packages. Okay. So you know, if you already have this in your refrigerator or in your cabinet at home, then you'll just need four of these to make 16 ounces. Oh, a little bit of math there too, huh? Yeah, how about <laughs> it? And I just wanted to show that if it's something you already have at home, That's you great. don't have to go out and buy a jar of applesauce, you already have this. Yes. So just use the ones that you already have. And it doesn't matter if it's cinnamon or strawberry, you can just throw whatever no. one you got. Whatever your, whatever your taste is or, or your your students taste or your child what they may like or don't like. So one of these, one recipe of this is going to do four eight ounce servings. So, um, and this is going to be um, six ounces of yogurt. It's a vanilla, vanilla yogurt. And if you wanted to substitute with um, the Greek yogurt and do something that's higher in protein, you certainly could. Okay. And then now we're going to do the orange juice part. Did you want to pour it in here? Nope, you can do it. That's and we're going to do 16 ounces of this as well. So again, So how many to, smoothies would this make? Um, what we're doing is going to make four eight ounce smoothies as a result of our hard work and efforts. Perfect. So it's 16 ounces of orange juice, 16 ounces of applesauce, and six ounces of yogurt. So I know the school nutrition department has been working on a lot of grab and go meals. Is that because kids, they don't want to necessarily sit when they're eating breakfast or, you know, a lot of times everyone's really busy trying to get get to school or get yeah. to class. Try this too, it might okay. help break up the yogurt. I, I think part of it is also we're transitioning from being in COVID and um, feeding in a total grab and go environment, where now we're doing more trying to, you know, where the students were eating in the classroom and now we're trying to get back to normal. So we're like easing it in in stages um, to help it a smoother transition for the students. And September is Better Breakfast Month. What are some of the things that the school nutrition, uh, nutrition department is doing to try to promote more kids to eat breakfast? Right, so along with the fruits and vegetables that we offer on a daily basis, we're also doing things like this, like the smoothies, to encourage the students to try something new. And, and these have been a hit. Um, even some of the younger students as they're coming up to get breakfast, and I'm 
you know, pitching it at the end of the line, um, like I'm at the baseball stadium uh, throwing <laughs> Cracker Jacks or something. Uh, sunshine Smoothie, Sunshine Smoothie. So the students hear that as they're coming in the line. Oh, we have something new, smoothies. So, you know, they get really excited about it. So, But I also think they're getting excited about the name. You know, it's marketing too. I mean, I'd want to drink a Sunshine Smoothie yeah. just in like, here's a smoothie. <laughs> I told them it's life changing and epic. <laughs> it is. Trying to use those, you know, terms yeah. that they would use nowadays. It's all in so. the marketing. So how long do you have to whisk this? You just want to combine the ingredients. Okay. And then um, we're going to pour it into these cups. So it looks like the smoothie is ready. This is super quick to make, super mm -hmm. easy. Um, again, it is applesauce, yogurt, and orange juice. So That's it has a lot of nutrients in this. That's right. And it's simple and things that you probably have at home already that your students are probably eating. So what you could do is um, make it ahead and uh, put a lid on your cup and put it in the refrigerator. And then when your student um, is getting up in the morning and getting ready, maybe they need a little smoothie on the go before they go to school or something like that so it's something you can do ahead as well Great. and you can substitute ingredients for whatever your flavors are maybe um, you know they have different parade pears and you know different styles of applesauce so you can do it that way too all right well let's taste cheers cheers to you it's good it's nice and sweet yeah it tastes really good and you're getting all the nutrients and it tastes good at the same time. Yep. And to round out the meal for the students when they would choose this as their breakfast. So they have the yogurt, so that would be the meat, meat alternative. They have applesauce, so that would be their fruit. The other component that would be missing from this to make it a complete meal would be their grain. So we usually offer, like the, as an example, the goldfish graham crackers or a whole grain pop tart is something that we use. So. And they can still um, have a milk or another fruit to uh, make it a well-balanced breakfast for the student. Of course, because that's what is important to have all the food groups, correct? That's right. Eat the rainbow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing this recipe. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Erin and we're here at the Pediatric Wellness Center at Metro Health. We're out here in our Pediatric Wellness Center garden and today we are making an easy tomato basil pasta with tomatoes and basil right from our garden. So for this pasta all we have is tomatoes. I have grape tomatoes here that I cut in half, basil, pasta, some garlic, olive oil and spices. For spices I just have salt and some red pepper flakes if you like it spicy. The first thing we want to do is boil our pasta. Okay, 
here I have whole wheat pasta. The reason I went with the whole wheat instead of some of the newer ones is because those tend to be smaller packages and cost a little more money. So if you have a large family, it might not be economical for your family to buy those, some of those newer pastas. So whole wheat will give you a little more fiber and a little more protein, which will keep you fuller for longer and will fill you up faster. So it's a little heartier. So we wanna get our pasta boiling and you're gonna cook it to the package directions. So it says nine to 11 minutes. I'm going to cook it for the full 11 minutes because our sauce is not cooked. It's a raw sauce. So that's gonna get boiling there. I have tomatoes that I'm cutting in half. So these are just cherry tomatoes or grape tomatoes. You could use full-size chopped tomatoes as well. So these are chopped up nice and bite-sized here. And actually I'm gonna to toss them right in our bowl along with the garlic. I have one clove of garlic. Now if you really like garlic, you could go more, but because it's not cooked, it is going to have a very strong flavor. So I just did one clove there and a quarter of a cup of olive oil. Okay, or any oil you have will work for this. So little red pepper flakes, depending on how spicy you like it, I'm gonna do about a teaspoon of that. And we're also gonna do about a teaspoon of salt. Okay, and we'll give that a stir. Our pasta is all cooked. We cooked it according to the package directions, and I'm just going to add it into our marinated tomatoes. So you, and what you want to add it right after you drain it. Don't rinse it or anything. You want it to be added while it's steaming hot. And I'm going to give it a stir, and then I just have one last ingredient to add, and that is basil. Okay, so I have our fresh basil here. You want to kind of bunch it up and then cut it into little slices. Okay, so I'll add our fresh basil in, give it another stir, and that's it. And I really like this also because it can be served hot, room temperature, or even cold, like a pasta salad. So this is a nice healthy dish because we used whole wheat pasta, which is a good source of fiber and it does also give you some protein. We have our tomatoes, so you'll get a serving of vegetables in there, and a healthy fat from the olive oil. Hi, I'm Carla Neely, the 2022 District 11 Teacher of the Year and also the Ohio Teacher of the Year finalist. And I am here on a three minute shopping spree at Kids in Need to get supplies for my students for the new school year. Let's go. Congratulations for being a state teacher of the year finalist. Thank you. So I'll tell you the rules for your shopping spree. It's three minutes. You can go in the store and take as much of anything you want in which you, as long as you get it in three minutes. Okay. All right? Yes. All right, so get a cart. We'll start at that door and we'll count you down. Here's my bag. Here. Okay, I've got the bag. Ready? Yeah. Go! trying to really look and run around at the same time to see where everything was so that I can get everything. Looking at what the girls need, they pretty much told me they love to use highlighters, they love the comp notebooks, they're always running out of folders. Just by the last minute I found the disinfectant wipes because that was one of the main things I said I needed. way to say thank you and to congratulate the teachers and thought this would be a great way to do that, to have them come in and shop um, for school supplies for their students and their school. 
right, so she gets those um, potato for the highlight. Everything on my list. Hold on, hold on. Did you get everything you think you need? Yeah, I think I remembered everything on the list that I put on there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. Carla? Yes. You saved nine hundred and ninety-two dollars in a three-minute shopping spree. Awesome. <laughs> Tired out. <laughs> I really appreciated it. I was honored. I got as much as I could in three minutes. Um, most of the time, um, I spend a lot of my own money. Most of us teachers do spend our own money to get the students what they need. So being able to come in here, have the opportunity to have a limited amount of supplies in three minutes, that really helps out a lot. So it's an honor. And for me to be able to show people what girls are doing in the science realm and how I'm, how I'm training future girls to be a part of the science and even the STEM network in the community and in the world pretty much. Your kids are going to be so excited. Hi, I'm Darielle Snipes with the CMSD News Bureau, and I am here with Executive Chef Tim Wright with the CMSD School Nutrition Department, and he is going to talk to us about some exciting things on the menu for kids this year. Hi, Chef. Hey, it's nice to meet you. Thanks for coming down to our kitchen. Anytime. So you guys are doing amazing things here in the School Nutrition Department, and you have some exciting new menu, exciting new items on the menu for kids this year, Can you, and one of them is dumplings. Can you talk about how dumplings got on the menu? Sure, like you said, one of the new exciting items that we have is an Asian style chicken and vegetable dumpling and a whole wheat, whole grain wonton wrapper. You know, a little too technical, but... No, but the whole wheat, that makes it healthier, right? Right, and it's something that we have to introduce to all the meals to make sure the students are eating a balanced diet. 
one of those things is whole grains we have to make sure is included in every item that we serve. So. And so talk to me about the process because it's not something you just throw on the menu and say, here, eat this. The kids actually have a say in what goes on the menu, correct? That's right, and there's a lot of care taken. Um, vendors approach us all the time with um, new items that they'd like to interest, introduce us to that they may be using in other districts. And things that are popular, they make sure we see them because we're such a large district. So once they go through the procurement process and they make an appointment and they see our procurement manager, and then we have a team that sits and look at all the new items, and then we select one. So we selected the Asian dumplings we wanted to try, something new. So after we sample them and make sure it's something that we can replicate in our kitchens with the different sets of equipment and things that different schools have. So then we do a, a taste testing with area supervisors, managers, and people that work in our department. And then after they get the green light, then we go to a student testing and we'll test a grade school on the east side, a grade school on the west side, a high school on the east side, a high school on the west side. And we try to hit all those different little pockets and neighborhoods to make sure there's a balance of tastes that are being recognized by what the students like. So let's be honest, kids, their taste buds, a little bit different than adults and they can be a little bit picky. So how did the, the dumplings go over? Um, they went over well and this is something that we're doing different for high school because high schoolers are very um, in the know about what they want to eat now. And also they don't want to eat like they did when they were in grade school. They want to say, I don't eat in grade school anymore. So this is something more upscale we're trying to do for the high schools to make a difference for them. Okay, well, and this is something that can be duplicated at home. So show us how we can make this at home because you know, my daughter does love dumplings and I try to make them at home. I don't know if I'm successful at it. So show me please. So there's a lot of ready-made products um, in the supermarket now that you can find. So this one is a, like I said, chicken and vegetable and it's a pre-made dumpling, and we cook them from frozen for this recipe. And I have two methods that we can show today. One is using a bamboo steamer that you would set on top of a pot of boiling water. And it, this is something like you'd see in one of the Asian dim sum restaurants. So we'll line up the dumplings in there, and then we'll steam them in there. And the idea with the steam, they cook a lot more quickly than they do if you put them in the oven or in a skillet because the steam surrounds the product and it cooks more quickly. So not a lot of people might have this. So how much does something like this cost if someone wants to get this at their house? Um, I think when I bought this, this was like 10 to 15 oh, that's, bucks. That's cheap. Down in Asia Plaza, those little markets that they have, um, you can find a, a bamboo steamer. And I use it for other things too, um, not just dumplings, but also vegetables or steaming fish and things like that. And if someone doesn't have it, can, how can they do um, the dumplings without one? So that's the second way that I'm okay. going to show you. Okay in a skillet, we'll spray it with some pan spray. Well, let's just go ahead and get started. Oh yeah, started let's get then. started, you, you got it. <laughs> so I use a little bit of pan spray to keep them from sticking after we line them up in the skillet. Okay. So for this recipe, I'm just gonna do six dumplings in each. And so when you do taste testing with the students, um, what is the percentage you're looking for in order for it to get on a menu? Um, probably like 60% pass ratio, you know, depending on uh, the different student populations. And some things would be more popular for younger students and some things might be popular for, you know, the older students. And it's usually just a thumbs up or a thumbs down as the students are leaving the cafeteria after they eat and, ooh, I hated that or it tastes terrible or, yeah, I really like that, I want to try it okay. again. So no critiquing. It needs a little bit more huh. salt, you're not doing Right, that. no. <laughs> but what we do ask, like when we featured this, we were at a school at the different schools that we featured it when we first kicked it off. We asked them how they liked it and the schools that they liked it. And then we have a board up and we ask them other Asian things that may like lo mein, fried rice, things like that. So the next two things I'm gonna sample recipes for would be lo mein and also a fried rice because those two nice. things were most popular Perfect. from what the students would So want. once you put it in there. So then I'll put the lid on and then over a pot of boiling water. And this is gonna take about uh, eight minutes. Okay, that's that's fast. So we'll check that recipe, or check that when it's cooking. And actually, um, this is also called uh, pot sticker. You may have known it uh, by before also. So let me just get a little oh, water. I'm sorry, sorry Daria. No, you're fine. Let me move Went out back your way. to the camera. I apologize. No, you're fine. Oh, so that's a quick way to steam it as well. Yeah. So I'll just put a little bit of water on there, and then I'll put the lid on. So they're known as pot stickers because once you once the water cooks off in them, um, after it's steamed, the water will cook away and it'll form a nice uh, brown crust on the bottom and sometimes it'll stick to the pan. That's why they're called pot stickers. But the flavor's in the brown, so once that gets nice and um, 
caramelized on the bottom, it, it tastes really good. Now, aren't they also called dumplings as well? Dumplings, pot stickers, yep. Yeah. Um, generally speaking, if they're uh, deep fried or fried in a skillet, they would be pot stickers and steamed like this, it would be more considered a dumpling. But they're both delicious. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> The nutrition department has been amazing through the pandemic. I mean, you guys you were on the front lines, never stopped serving children and families throughout the pandemic. I mean, when you were told that the schools were shutting down, you, you pivoted immediately to make sure that kids were fed. That's right. Our um, managers, area supervisors, um, the people that I work on a daily basis with were on the front lines of this pandemic from the beginning. We served hundreds of thousands of meals to needy families in our neighborhood and the surrounding area that we took care of throughout the pandemic. And these ladies and gentlemen were troopers throughout it all. Kept their head up and kept going to work and feeding their kids is what they call them, their kids. They take ownership over the students that they feed on a daily basis. You can feel the love that they give to the, to the students that they feed. And, that, and because of the funding that CMSC received from the federal government, it wasn't just our kids, it was any child under 18 that needed a meal could come to a school and get a meal. Right, and uh, we kept sites open that were you know, maybe not as um, popular or they're off the beaten path because we didn't want to turn anyone away. So in pockets and neighborhoods where it may be considered a food desert, the school is the only place that someone could come to get a meal. So that was really important for it us. It was, and you guys did a great job. Yeah, it means a lot that we were able to do that. And so even though you had the, the meal sites at the schools, I mean, you guys did so much more with fresh produce to make sure that people were fed during this time. Yeah, we did a lot more on a uh, broader scale with um, dairy boxes, uh, fresh fruits and vegetable boxes. Um, Michelle Obama's program with uh, Pass to Love, um, I did a, a little thing for them on one of the uh, cooking shows locally. But yeah, we were constantly busy and giving out uh, tons of food, not just what we fed the students and families from our kitchens, but it was also out in the community where we're giving away boxes of food as well. So, I mean, now that the kids are back in school full time, um, you guys have pivoted back to pre-pandemic almost with the, with the food, in, in terms of food, correct? Food That's right. distribution. That's right. And it's a lot less cumbersome for us to be able to feed the students this way rather than trying to force a fit to make sure that things were ready for people to take home and knew how to cook them and make them at their house, it's easier for us to have the students come through like we're used to feeding them on a daily basis and to provide the nourishment that they need in that way. And um, how many new things would you say you have on the menu this year for, for students? Um, Pre-pandemic, you know, we went through the testing process like I had talked to you about, and we had a, a hot honey sloppy joe, you know that hot honey is a popular uh, flavor right now like sriracha and things like that people are really into. Uh, macaroni and cheese, we actually uh, sampled a macaroni and cheese. Uh, Nashville hot nugget. Nice. So all these things uh, the students had approved pre-pandemic so they were all queued up to start and then wham the pandemic came and it shut everything down so we had everything ready to go. So we had all those things ready and lined up to go when we reopen now. So. so this is not the food that I ate when I went to school. I mean I had no. hamburgers, cheeseburgers, hot dogs and a chicken sandwich. That was pretty much it. I mean why, why is it so important for CMSD Nutrition Department to have these like restaurant level meals for our students. I mean, I'm not mad at it. I think it's great, but right. you know, this is really cool. Well, I, one thing is we like to stay on trend with what we serve to the students that, that we provide for. Um, so when I was young and up and coming, people didn't see things like they do now. You know, some of these uh, fast casual restaurants, you customize it yourself. I want this sauce, I don't want that thing, I want some of those. So we're trying to get to a point where we're able to replicate some of those items in our kitchens to be able to provide for the students what they want because that's what they want. They want new and tasty things like that. So. And I'm, yeah, and they're healthy. I hear something sizzling, so let's check it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're getting, we're getting to the pot sticker part. Let's see how they're starting to develop a little bit of brown on the bottom there. Yeah. Looking so good. Oh, just a little more water. water. We don't want too much brown. No, no. <laughs> so, so how we'll do you know when they're just done? Just a little bit longer. Um, for this recipe, uh, this particularly needs to be cooked to 165 degrees of an internal temperature. So I'll use my um, probe thermometer to check the internal temperature to that to be sure that it's uh, cooked correctly. And so what if you don't have one at home? How can you tell? Um, 
I, if you don't have one, I recommend you get one. Okay. Because there's no other way to make sure, especially for chicken, it's a potentially hazardous food, and if it's not cooked to the correct temperature, it can make people sick. Of course. So get a uh, probe thermometer, uh, preferably digital. It's easier to read, and it's more precise. Okay. And then, about, let's see how these are doing. So these are doing pretty good. So we'll check these once it's gone for about eight minutes. I haven't checked my watch in a minute, so we'll have to check and see. Not a problem. I mean, I think it's great. Eight minutes, I mean, it can be on the on the plate within 10. I mean, I know kids get home and they're starving. So this is something, right. instead of going to for the chips, they can go for this in, in 10 minutes. Right, we'll take care of that for them, no doubt. So chef, you know, a lot of people when they have dumplings or any type of Asian food, it, it, it's accompanied with some type of sauce, usually soy sauce. But you and the staff have been very conscientious about sodium count because uh, soy sauce has a lot of sodium. So what, what are the alternatives to, so, to soy sauce? So uh, when you're at the market, you can look at the different sauces. A lot of them do have a lot of inherent sodium in them, in them because of the way that they're made. So pick the one that's most suitable for you and your diet. For the students that we serve, we are regulated to make sure that we only use, you know, so many milligrams of sodium per student per day. So uh, we reached out to a manufacturer that makes a lower sodium orange sauce that we're in the process of testing now. Because another thing that students said that they wanted was orange chicken. Oh. So I'm going to take a, a play off of that and use this orange sauce. And if it's successful as a dumpling dip, then we can also use it to do a, a chicken dish so we can cross-utilize that same ingredient for two different recipes. Great, so, but you also have this ginger sriracha. Is that something that- That's something you? I brought special for you because oh. I knew you liked sriracha, so. <laughs> well, I'm going to try it because uh, I do like, I like sauce. Um, a couple of my friends uh, call me saucy because I like <laughs> sauce on everything, so I will try it. I can see you being saucy for sure. Oh, uh, you know, so, but yeah. So again, in the, in the aisle, like I was in the grocery this morning and they have a bunch of different sauces available, so um, pick one that suits you best um, for what your diet may be for sodium or whatever. Mm -hmm. And this one's a little spicy. I don't know if kids would like that. It's too spicy. Well, yeah, the, the younger ones might not like it. Yeah, yeah. But so, it is delicious. Yeah, we'll let we'll let them try and then let them tell us. And if um, this isn't a popular dish, it, it won't it won't last. So we'll replace this with something else. We always want to be innovative and new and bringing things that the students want. If they don't want it, I don't want it. That's right. So. Well, that's great. Well, you are doing a great job, and thank you so much for giving us these tips to how to make dumplings at home. Sure thing. Thank you. Or pot stickers, whichever one you want to call. Tomato, tomato. <laughs> <laughs>
helping schools open up and uh, they can work with their buildings uh, to help uh, create an atmosphere for reopening. And the atmosphere that is so important is that we aren't minimizing all the time they've been off and, and we, we lend voice to both our scholars and our staff on what have you been going through? What kind of issues have you been addressing? And just giving voice often helps, but if it's more severe, as I mentioned, having all of our resources available uh, to our uh, teachers and our school staff from internal to our external partners uh, to come to things quickly and help out uh, where necessary. And, and we're also making our staff aware that mental health issues could be more prevalent and, and that awareness is important so they're, they're looking for issues that may be there that our young people are struggling with. And so some families and some children might have a little bit of uneasiness about returning to the school buildings, mm -hmm. but they're doing it each day. But what advice could you give their families on, on how to cope? Uh, I think the first thing, um, we have to make sure that our young people know that they're going to be safe. And we have to talk about what safety protocols are put into place and that there are people to help them out uh, if they need it. Uh, there are people to go to. Uh, once again, as I mentioned, their voice. What things are bothering you? Uh, what things could, could be uh, of assistance? How can we help you is, is the real adjustment that we need to make. And, and having that patience to know that it's going to take some time. I think in addition to that, uh, creating um, some consistency, creating some routine. Uh, when we're out as long as we were, 18, 19 months, we have to create all new routines again. They had to create a new routine for the remote learning, now coming back, another new routine, uh, and helping them get that consistency and filling that routine so they know what's next. People always want to know what's next so they're prepared for it. Mm -hmm. So when you talk through those routines, as our staff will do with their young people, you know, at 9 o'clock we'll do this, at 9.30 we'll be doing this, that they know what to expect. They know when transitions are happening. They know that when they uh, go to a different classroom that it's still going to have social distancing appropriateness of that and that uh, folks are going to be using masks and, and washing hands uh, on a regular basis. And would you say it's also good to have that type of routine at home as well? Absolutely. Um, the more routine the easier it is to fall into change so that things are happening on a regular basis. I would hope that our uh, families are doing the same thing. And when I talk about routine, uh, what time they go to bed at night, what time they get up, are they having a breakfast, what time does the bus get there, everything laid out in a routine and I might suggest that they write those things down, post them. On, on the refrigerator that every, you know everyone puts everything on that refrigerator but so so the young person can look and say oh I've got about 10 minutes and the bus will be here so it's right there for them to see it so our youngsters our scholars may not be able to communicate effectively what they're going through or how they're feeling just because they're children mm -hmm. um, so what indicators what should a parent or educator look for to realize that that child is anxious about something? Usually it is major change. Something is happening. For example, uh, a child that was very outgoing is now withdrawn to some degree. Or an, in, uh, an individual that uh, was really strong in math or reading and now may be struggling. Uh, for particularly our young people, is being in tune to 
their complaints about illness. Uh, I have a stomach ache today, I can't go to school. My head hurts, I'd like to stay home. And we need to uh, be aware of that and know that that could be a sign that I'm not ready to go to school or I might be afraid to go to school. So I think major change, eating habits, sleeping habits, friends as they change, grades, and then noting when they're not feeling well and, and um, helping them through that. Uh, do we need to take your temperature? Should we make an appointment at the doctor? Uh, things like that that will help them uh, uh, cope with what's going on. Because as, as you mentioned, being children, they cope differently often than we do, and we want to be in tune to that. And so what should a parent or educator do if a child is exuding these type of symptoms, um, crying for help that you know, they may not want to go to school? Uh, the resources that we have at our schools would be extremely helpful. So uh, I recommend that if parents are anxious themselves or their child is that they have a connection with the school, either with their classroom teacher or the principal. Uh, being COVID, we can't just drop in on a school, but making an appointment and, and sharing what you're seeing and then taking advantage of the resources. Uh, we also have uh, from our nurses uh, our COVID hotline that they can get in touch with as well. And uh, we have our rapid response desk, uh, crisis response, that if a child is in crisis, the principal can let our uh, rapid response coordinators know so then we can follow up with resources and, and assist that child in whatever crisis they're in. And, and then well, what if it's the parent that is having the anxiety? What can, a, what can a parent do to make sure that they feel okay or are adjusting? I would suggest first, and, and Eric uh, has done a great job of communicating, uh, get back and see the things he's put out that share what those safety precautions are. Also, contacting the school and as I mentioned, getting an appointment to make sure that the school is utilizing all those safety precautions. And, and just sharing your concern. It may be a legitimate concern that only that parent has, and so if they share it, it can be addressed uh, by the school. And so obviously these are tough times. This is the third school year where we're dealing with a pandemic. So mm -hmm. what's the best advice that you could give families as they're trying to deal with going to school and COVID? Uh, I put at the top of my list, patience and grace. And I think that is so important. Controlling your emotions uh, because you are a model to your child. So if you're having extreme difficulties, they pick up on that as well. Uh, I would suggest that they minimize uh, watching the news because it can, it can scare a child. Uh, when you're speaking with children, using age-appropriate language so they can understand what's happening. Uh, letting them know and assuring them that they will be safe and that the adults will do as many things as possible to make sure they're safe and, and to, to observe. I think it's very important for all of our adults to, to look and listen and then share with hope and share with honesty and share with kindness because we are not all sure of what everyone else is going through. So the more we can share um, with kindness and listening to other people, the better off we'll be. Well, that is some great advice. Bill Stencil, thanks for your time. My pleasure. Thank you.
We chose CMSD because of school choice and the resources and opportunities that she was going to be afforded um, by coming to a high school within the district. My daughter attends the School of Science and Medicine. I don't think she's, she also doesn't think she would have gotten this experience um, and this challenge at any other school. She's in um, advanced placement classes. She has the opportunity to take her foreign language at C, um, Cleveland State University, um, as well as taking like psychology and anatomy, which are actually college level classes that she's actually taking in high school. It's very important because it lays the foundation um, to prepare her for success in, in college. 